here because the outside world rejects you. Pizza dude's got 30 seconds. Are you crazy? Ever since Ninja Turtles the movie came out in 1990, the film has been a fan favorite, and the appreciation of this classic has fanned decades. We still get figures of these versions of the characters that get released yearly, and there seems to be no slowing down anytime soon. Fans absolutely love it. Even people that are really no longer Turtles fans still remember key moments from the movie. The Turtle Power song, the epic one-liners from the film. Cricky! Now, some fans of this legendary film may not know this, since we didn't get a director's commentary here in the US, but there is one out there. It was released on the German Blu-ray of the film a few years back, but the commentary is in English. I had the pleasure of watching it recently and 10 things stood out to me that I want to talk about here today with you guys. So, as we always do, grab a slice of pizza and dive into the sewers because today we're going to take a look at 10 rare facts about TMNT 1990. Yes, sir. The shots of the opening sequence up into where the Foot Clan and the Foot Recruits are stealing TVs and electronics were shot after the fact. Director of the movie, Steve Barron, explains in the commentary that with only seven weeks to shoot the film and an initial budget of $7 million, which mostly went to the turtle suits, they had to cut out a pretty epic opening sequence. He explains that turtle shells were supposed to come out of the sewers, which I do think we get a peek of in the original trailer of the movie, but it's not in the film itself. He says we would have also got more visuals of the going-ons in the sewer world, intercut with more epic shots of New York as he describes it. Unfortunately, he says the opening had to be shot smaller and tighter due to these budgetary restrictions, but you can almost see it in your head what it would have been like. Baron explains in the commentary how the film was mostly shot in North Carolina. Didn't they use this place in the Grapes of Wrath? As they needed a lot of controlled environments to pull off what they did, and that that was a little bit difficult to do in the big city. But they did go to New York for some shots. The exterior of Shredder's warehouse, Raphael when he's on the rooftop blowing off some steam. Although, he does explain how those wide shots of him in the city, which are intercut with him fighting on the rooftop against the foot, which was on a set, was kind of hard to pull off getting the aesthetics to match between the two environments that they shot in. Personally, I think it came off pretty seamless, especially for the time. Another time they went to New York to film was when Raphael is coming out of the movie theater and stops some robbers from stealing a lady's purse. As soon as we cut into the park, these scenes were shot in North Carolina. Again, pretty cool how they weaved the two different locations to feel like it was all happening in the big city. One thing that was really fascinating hearing Baron talk about was the turtles themselves. He explains how these were actors in suits carrying around 60 pounds of animatronics, electronics, and servos in their shell, and that this was a big challenge for the Jim Henson Creature Shop. He explains how they cast young actors to play the turtles, and that they tried to go for a blend of both performers and actors, explaining that the Leonardo actor had done suit work before, whereas the Raphael actor had never worn a suit and mask like that, and that he would get really uncomfortable comfortable in it, to the point where they would have to rip off the head in between shots, which wasn't easy to do. He goes on to say that they did extensive casting to find the right bodies that would go into the suits. But it wasn't only that, they also had to find the right puppeteers that would match each actor's style, in that there wasn't just one puppeteer. There was one for the mouth, others for the eyes, others for the eyebrows, and that everyone had to work in sync. He talks about how the actors inside of the suit and the puppeteers doing the mouth movements would both be doing the lines at the same time. Time. So on the set, you'd get two voices doing the same character, and that when they would re-watch the footage, it sounded like a mess. That you just had to suspend your belief and go with your instincts that it would come out good in the end. Cricket! Nobody understands cricket! At one point in the commentary, he discusses how Bobby Herbick, writer of the movie, went out to England to stay with him while he was writing the film. I actually remember Bobby talking about that in an interview I had with him here on the channel a while back. Anyway, Steve explains how he took Bobby to a cricket game and that that inspired the cricket line for Casey Jones in the film, which is actually a pretty epic line from the movie that everybody remembers, especially when Raph starts going off about the game. Anyway, it's pretty cool to hear the origin of where this came from. Cricket. So as we mentioned earlier, a lot of the movie was made in North Carolina and was actually filmed nearby a local military airport. Now the turtles' faces, which were controlled by puppeteers through radio signals, would apparently get scrambled by the airplanes that were landing nearby, and this would cause the turtle faces to go haywire, going into involuntary spasms. I can only imagine what this could have looked like. It sounds hilarious. But as a filmmaker, it was probably incredibly frustrating.
Another thing you learn from the commentary is that the turtle's den where they lived was built four feet off the ground. You'd never know by just looking at the movie. Anyways, this was so they could have the puppeteers under the floor at all times, particularly for Splinter who was puppeteered a little bit in a more traditional way with a hand controlling what the character did instead of an actual full body inside of the suit. But this four foot clearance above the ground was also good for the turtles for any time they needed cables attached to them. They would run these underneath the floor and hook them up to the turtles. I can assume for maybe more accurate movement when compared to the radio signal technique. Apparently this was also done for April's apartment. The puppeteers down there would be looking at monitors to be able to see what was going on through a camera, but they could not actually see what was physically happening above them. Everyone had to coordinate through the screens. It's very interesting hearing him talk about how they made these custom sewers for the turtles. He explains how they had to get the look right and how everything had to be wet and adding details like tide marks on the wall, giving it real texture. Apparently it was a really extensive build and a lot went into it. He describes it as probably their most comprehensive set of the film. The manhole covers that are on the street level when the turtles go up to the surface had to be custom made on the set of where they filmed. The turtles were too big to fit through a regular manhole cover. So so they dug underneath the set. But in Wilmington, North Carolina, apparently there's a lot of water underneath the ground if you dig down deep enough. So as they dug, they found water and it ended up flooding. So to have the turtles use it the way they wanted, they would have to pump it out to have enough space for the turtles to go down there and show them coming up. I have heard stories in different interviews of cast and crew of this film talking about how this created a big bug problem. Mosquitoes or something if I'm remembering correctly. But yeah, pretty interesting. Another thing that stood out to me from the commentary is when he talks about how they would watch dailies, parts of the film that they had already recorded that they just reviewed, and that Baron, the director, really enjoyed the level of lighting and the darkness of the aesthetics, but that they got a lot of notes from the studio who were frightened that they were making it too dark, that kids wanted it bright and colorful. Boy, were they wrong. At least in my opinion. As a kid, I loved the dark and gritty aesthetics of the film. Again, it's just my opinion, but I believe it's one of the elements that makes that first movie stand out from all the others and why it's so beloved. Anyways, at one point the director, Baron, caught someone talking to the director of photography or the cinematographer, saying it's gotta be lighter, it's gotta be brighter, you gotta brighten it up. But that Baron seriously fought that, that he believed kids could appreciate something that was not just bright and colorful, and that he felt also that if there was one story that they were trying to get across was that these turtles came from the sewers and that that's where it's all dark and that's how they would grow up, coming out at night and things of that nature. I honestly love that he fought for this. It's one of the most important decisions, I believe, that made this movie the smash hit that it became. It was great! Baron does mention at the end of the commentary that hypothetically, if he ever were to make the turtles again today, the approach would be a little bit different. That he loved the way that they were on set, really with us, lit practically by lights and things of that nature. And that he doesn't think he would go fully CGI, but that he would probably use a combination of both practical and CGI. Having the turtles in real suits that really touch the ground, that you can touch and feel and move around, and then possibly add parts of the face the mouth and eyes in post with modern technology to push it up a level. Again, I think Baron is spot on with this point. I think he was right back then with the decisions he was making on the film. And I think with his approach of how he would do the turtles today is also the right approach. In his closing thoughts on the commentary, Baron tells an interesting story. He says that pretty soon after the film came out, about three months later, that he got a call and was told to come into Steven Spielberg's office, having never met him before. That Spielberg asked them to do a film, which he says in hindsight he stupidly turned down. The film was Casper the Friendly Ghost. Anyways, Spielberg said that he and his boy, who was around 10 years old at the time, had watched Ninja Turtles three times and that he loved it, that he thought it was so different and special and that he wanted to work with Baron on something. And the feeling was mutual, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, they never did quite find the right project, but Baron does say in the commentary that that was the sort of impact a film like this can have on your career, especially when it makes so much at the box office. All right, everyone, these were 10 things that stood out to me from the director's commentary of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1990, my favorite version of the Ninja Turtles. Let me know down below which one of these interesting facts stood out to you the most. I personally liked how when they were getting notes from the studio that the film was too dark, that he stood by his vision. I think it's one of the big reasons why this movie means so much to everybody. Everyone loves how dark and gritty that first movie looks while still being a fun adventure. Thank you guys everybody for watching. I'll see you guys in a little bit with another video. Take care. Armed.